Hello, welcome to the Cote Moss Brand Live. We have winemaker Bastien Lagouf, and we also have wine journalist and writer uh, Jamal Reis. And they're here to answer your questions, so please send in as many questions as possible and enjoy. Here we go. Why don't you, uh, let's see, why don't you talk about Cote Mas, perhaps uh, Paul Mas uh, in, to start off with, and also perhaps more generally about the history of the um, of Mission and Paul Mas's All right. residence. So, um, Paul Mas is a, uh, this company who uh, carries the Cote Mas, uh, where we are making the Cote Mas wine. So, um, these Cote Mas uh, sparkling wines are made in saint hilaire in the south of France, in Languedoc. Uh, just foothills of the Pyrenees. Uh, it's a place, the first place in the world where uh, where we have done sparkling wine in 1531. So it's quite old history, and uh, and we uh, we're still making uh, sparkling wines in two way. Uh, there is a traditional method, uh, like we are doing sparkling uh, in Champagne, and we also have method ancestral. Uh, maybe we'll have time to uh, speak about method ancestral uh, a bit later. Um, the Domaine Paul Mas, uh, it's seven estates around Languedoc. So uh, some estates are near the coast and some estates are uh, around the, the Pyrenees. So two different climates. Uh, I think um, it's important for people to understand that the land of Michelin is uh, is the world's largest wine producing region. Um, so uh, for many years it was known as a bulk wine region, but really since the late 70s to the 80s, particularly the 90s to, to today, it's really um, the, the emphasis has been more on quality wines. Um, some really exceptional wines, which some of them are getting quite expensive, but also a number of wines that are really good quality that are offering some um, some very good value. Uh, in terms of the different producers, Walmas is, is really, for me, has been really kind of at the forefront um, of, of, of quality producers, which are really kind of popularizing the region. You know? and there's some very top quality wines, but you know, generally the, the wines are very accessible to the average person. Uh, I think when you say accessible, well, it's really our philosophy. We uh, we like to talk about the rural luxury, and the rural luxury is the fact you can, uh, when you come back home, just open a bottle, can be a bottle of sparkling wine, can be a bottle of steel wine, and enjoy it. Something easy to drink, something you'll uh, enjoy at the moment, and uh, that's how we want to do the wines, and, uh, um, and something really affordable and a great value for the, the, co the quality and the price. I mean. Now, um, the, the company has made, the, the, the winery has made several different wines and has different, different estates. Um, you mentioned in the conversation before um, broadcast that uh, that uh, Pomas acquired a winery in Limu, which is in this particular, so the northwest corner of, of the Languedoc, which is, um, you know, Languedoc is a warm Mediterranean region, but this is a bit higher in elevation, uh, has a particular soils that have very high chalk or uh, limestone content, which is considered to be kind of important for for quality uh, sparkling wines, um, and a long tradition. We mentioned back 1531 being the first documented production of sparkling wine, the deliberately uh, sparkling wine um, in the area. So, what did um, acquiring this this estate, Dumin uh, Martinon, yeah. yes, um, do for the creation of this particular project? So uh, in Domaine Martino, we, uh, we are really lucky because um, so uh, we uh, acquired the, the, the estate in 2011, and so we have pretty old grapes. Uh, uh, in average, we are around 25 years old, and most of the parcels have a north orientation. Uh, if I say that, it's because it's really important when you do sparkling wine, especially in, uh, in the new, in, uh, in Languedoc area. As you say, it's, it's a bit warm, it's much more warm than, uh, than in, uh, uh, in Champagne okay. in, uh, or in the Loire Valley. So um, 
we need to play with whatever we can because uh, the north orientation will increase the maturation uh, time. Um, That's because it, because it's it's cooler for those uh, wine bloggers. So you guys know something about this, but it's because uh, when you have a warm climate, you want to try to reduce the amount of heat that you receive during the day. And south-facing vines receive more sunshine during, during, during the day. So if, it's, so if it's in the north, north-facing, you actually are able to extend the maturation period yeah. and also conserve acidity. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And w we are lucky because we are near the, the Pyrenees uh, at a high altitude, and so we have a big uh, diurnal shift. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. So um, we can have warm day and colder night. Um, in uh, in Limoun, you don't need air conditioning. I mean, the during the night you open your your windows, you will be cold, and during the day you close your your windows, and uh, you will keep the the freshness of the night. Yeah. And um, I say it in a funny way, but it's really important because uh, this diurnal shift will increase again the period of maturation. So uh, we will have um, a high, pretty high level of acidity for uh, for the area, and uh, um, and most of it it's a good ratio between the sugar and the uh, and the acidity um, because if you harvest really early, you have all the time uh, high acidity, but you don't have enough sugar. Uh, here we have a good ratio when, uh, between the acidity and the sugar. So, um, speaking about harvest times, what um, when you, you pick, well, you use a different system that we do. Are you just picking bricks? So what, what are the bricks? Do you know? Uh, yeah, oh, uh, so bricks, you mean the sugar right? content, yeah. Yeah, um, so we, uh, we use the it's a potential of alcohol. Right, okay. okay. Um, we will um, look for 10, de 10 degrees of potential of alcohol okay. for, uh, uh, for the method traditionnel. Mm -hmm. uh, so we will pick some grapes before the harvest just to check the, um, the increase of sugar and the decrease of pH. Uh, oh, Sorry, the increase also of pH, right. so decrease yeah. of uh, total acidity. Just to say, yeah. Okay. Uh, so we will try to uh, to harvest when we will get 10 degrees of uh, potential uh, alcohol. Okay. Yeah. And that's for the the three different ones. Uh, well, actually, we should we should perhaps tell. <laughs> actually, they we, all know. We have some questions about the specific wines, and I think you know we oh. can talk about them individually. Uh, but we have a question about the the Blanc fruit. Okay. Um, uh, so mosaic is a grape most Americans aren't familiar with. Um, what's the characteristics and what does it bring to the wine and is it unique to the Limoux? So, yeah, so mosaic is, uh, is native from, uh, from Limoux and Gaillac, which is really uh, near, near Limoux, uh, about one hour drive. Yeah, it's, it's uh, in the southwest region yeah. of France, so it's just the yeah, same exactly. historic region. Yeah. Um, it has been spread a bit everywhere in France, but since that's it's only in uh, in the Limu and Gaillac area that we still grow uh, the mosaic. Um, it's really big grapes with uh, uh, a thick skin and a high level of acidity, and it will keep the acidity uh, for quite a long time. Yeah, sure. Thanks. That's what we're talking about. This. So, so. Uh, yeah. we. Uh, most of the time, the mosaic will uh, uh, will bring some uh, aroma of uh, apple, uh, apple, green apple, yeah, um, pear, pear, yeah, yeah. Uh, and and yeah, I think uh, if we grow mosaic in uh, in in Limoux, it's to make sparkling wines because uh, we were talking about the maturation uh, maturation period. We harvest the mosaic like three weeks after the chardonnay, so uh, maturation period is uh, is quite longer. I'd like to th sort of throw in something. So these are the 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 the, uh, the blanc de blanc is uh, it's blanc, no, it's not blanc de blanc. No, there's, there's some sort of, there's some pinot noir in there as well. Uh, well, just say the brut, okay? Uh, 
the brute is, is designated Cremont Yimou. There's also a designation, traditional, well, I don't want to use the word traditional, but there's also a category called Blanquette de Yimou, which is um, by regulation has to be at least 90% yeah. of mosaic. And in, before the regulations were formalized, there was a fear by many producers that the success of Chardonnay in the region was going to displace the traditional grape mosaic. And as a, re as a way of kind of conserving it, they created these two different categories. Blanquette de Limoux, which has to be 90% uh, mosaic, and then Cremont de Limoux, which requires a minimum of 40% Chardonnay, a minimum of 20% uh, uh, Chenin Blanc, uh, and then uh, a maximum of 20% uh, of Mosaic and Pinot Noir. Yeah. You can you, 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 yeah. add it. You, you, yeah. now you, you can, you can uh, play with the percentages as you yeah. like. But um, So this is a way. So the, the, the idea was that Mosaic, uh, the Blanquette de Limoux, was going to create kind of a more um, rustic one, I don't, not in a, in a pejorative way, but perhaps more traditional. Uh, whereas the Cremont was going to be a little more, have a little more finesse, to be a little more in line with uh, international taste for champagne and other things. No, I, is I that think, right? Or? I think the fear were, were maybe real, and uh, uh, and everybody predicts that uh, the blanket will disappear. Uh, Twenty years later. Uh, the Blanquet and the Cremant are in the same level of production. Uh, okay. It's almost 50-50%. Mm -hmm. So uh, maybe a bit more of Cremant now. Um, I think the Cremant, um, also first for the Blanquet with 90% of, uh, of Mozac, uh, it's something really fresh, really um, uh, easy drinking. It's an easy drinking wine. Um, not really aromatic, but with some flavors of uh, of apple or, or, or pear. But um, it's really something you will drink for aperitif and uh, uh, for or in a cocktail. Mm -hmm. um, so it's something interesting. But the Cremant, uh, I think, is uh, it's more international. It's something that uh, looks like a bit more of champagne yeah. Uh, yeah. and uh, and something more accessible. Uh, so, um, well, getting back to the Blanquette for a minute, I mean, it's got some sweetness in it. So, what would be some foods that you'd recommend pairing with that? This is the Blanquette, the uh, method ancestral. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. So that food, food pairing. Okay. Uh, uh, so, for the food pairing, because the the Blanquette method ancestral is. Uh, we have also to talk about uh, the process. The process is different and explain why we have some uh, uh, residual sugar. Right, because method ancestral is not the same as Blanquette de Limoux. Yeah, exactly. It's a different thing. Blanquette de Limoux is generally, can be different levels of sweetness, but it generally is a dry wine. Mm. So, uh, with regard to uh, the method ancestral, how, how, how do you do it? And then, oh, by the way, Apple tart, we determined that's the best pairing for, for Blanquette. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, for sure. Apple buy is. Uh, Good choice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah, yeah. Okay. So, all right. But why don't you describe uh, how how this is made? So um, we harvest later than for the the brut. Uh, we harvest at a potential degree of alcohol around uh, 13 or 14 degrees uh, of alcohol, and um, we start the first fermentation uh, in stainless vat, uh, and one one to get six degree of effective alcohol, mm -hmm. we uh, stop the fermentation by chilling the wine and by the filtration. So um, we will keep the wine at a low temperature. We will be around um, 32 Fahrenheit, so zero degree Celsius. Yeah. Uh, so um, zero degree Celsius. And uh, we'll keep it like that, um, which is months of uh, January or traditionally, traditionally uh, the month of March. We will put it in bottle, adding some yeast, and start a second fermentation in bottle. So you fil so you filter the yeast out in the, from the from the primary fermentation. Yeah. There was still enough sugar for it to continue fermenting, but you ferment that out. You leave the 
you leave the residual sugar in the wine, you filter, you cold chill it, you filter, and then you put the, ball, the, the now the, the base wine, which yeah. has some residual sugar, and in, into the bottle. Yeah, some residual sugar, yeah. some yeast. So uh, we are around, at this time we are around 100 grams of sugar per liter, uh, which is quite high. Yeah, uh, sure. With the second fermentation, we will consume 24 grams of sugar. So we will get six bars of pressure and 7.5 degrees of alcohol. You will left 80 grams of residual sugar. But because... Uh, so, so, so it's less, it's less bubbly than, uh, than the regular group. Uh, it's, um, it's different kind of bubble because uh, the, the aging is a little bit shorter. Okay. So uh, the bubble will be a bit bigger. All right. Uh, because well, it's the leaves, the leaves uh, and the aging um, has the potential to, to get really tiny, tiny bubbles. Right. Uh, on the on the metal ancestral, is, uh, the bubbles are a bit bigger, but uh, it's a nice, uh, yeah, nice fit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not crude. No. And uh, and so yeah, we uh, we will have uh, uh, we will do a disgorgement at uh, 80 grams of uh, sugar left, but because it's mosaic, because there is a high level of acidity, it's still something fresh, even with the residual sugar. Right. Would you say that that's more of a dessert wine or not necessarily? Yeah. Um, I think small. that's a question of question, culture. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because I mean, the uh, uh, you know, in the south of France. It's very traditional to have an aperitif that's a bit sweet. So oftentimes you have a little glass of muscat, which we consider dessert wine here, or a glass of, of something like this, because it sweetness helps stimulate the appetite. Well, something's very dry, just like wine stimulates the appetite. It doesn't matter what you have. Yeah. So, um, but I mean, I think I think in, in, in applied to the American context, it is a it'd be like a nice dessert, or perhaps like a intermediary between dessert and uh, and the main course if you if you have room um, uh, I actually like strangely I like um, slightly sweet wines with some cheeses particularly um, pungent cheeses but I think the, the sweetness helps kind of tame the um, the uh, the wild the wild aromas of some of some of the cheeses um, also, uh, well, it's fine for, for spicy food, too. I mean, it's, a, it's cliche in some way, but it really is true. Yeah. Oh, drinking also at 4 p.m. with a, a slide of... A I slide it out <laughs> by. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So let's focus on the individual wines just for a bit um, as you drink them. So should we start with the rosé since it's to the side? Okay. We have some questions specifically about the rosé. So. Okay. Uh, if you could discuss the compositions of the grapes in this wine and what each lends characteristically. On the rosé, we have 70% um, of Chardonnay, 20% of uh, Chenin Blanc, and 10% of Pinot Noir. So there is no mosaic on, uh, on the rosé. Um, one is something fruity with um, um, red. Red fruit, um, red fruit or black fruit uh, flavors. Uh, in the nose. Uh, uh, we have a, a beautiful structure. Um, Venus. Yeah. Um, Venus. Yeah. It's, it, you mean? I mean, obviously, you guys all know what that means. But for those of you out in the uh, in, in the world who are watching this, who don't know what it means, it's more like regular still wine than in some ways than than, uh, than bubbly. And. Uh, we have really uh, um, a tiny bottle due to the aging because it's uh, an aging of these uh, at least of one year. Here we are more than uh, around one year and a half, two years of aging. Um, and we have the um, nice pale salmon color. Mm. So, uh, How does that um, compare to the aging of the, um, of the Cremant Blanc, the regular group? It's um, almost the same aging. Okay, uh, so about 18 months or two years. Yeah, it's about yeah, 18 months or two years. So uh, um, 
yeah, for the uh, the aging is it's an average because we will start the disgorgement with, uh, with the first load, uh, the first load batch uh, around one year, a bit more than one year. And we the regulations the require you for Clément to be a minimum of twelve months. Yeah, twelve Correct. months before selling. Before you selling, you can you can disgorge uh, after nine months. Oh, for the Clément too. But you cannot sell it. I okay? see. <laughs> so, yeah, so, the, so the blanket is nine months. Nine months before of, selling. Yeah. And uh, and before selling and before disgorgement for the blanket I for see. the criminal okay. it's uh, nine months before disgorgement but you cannot release after one okay. uh, before one year. Okay. So uh, I don't see the point to uh, to get disgorgement before sell it. Mm -hmm. So uh, so basically everybody is disgorged after one year. But uh, yeah, the regulation is a bit uh, yeah, French. <laughs> well, the bureaucrats around the world, they don't yeah. have to be French, they think of other ways, if, uh, that doesn't make sense, but anyway. So for the rosé, since the grapes are the same as in the Blanc, is the only difference that the Pinot Noir stays on the skins longer? Yeah, part of Pinot Noir uh, stays on the skins longer. It's, um, it's rosé from uh, maceration, so, uh, uh, so the color comes from the Pinot Noir, obviously, because it's the only... Uh, uh, like grapes, but uh, yeah. Uh, so, but you're not making uh, so the rosé, the base wine for the Pinot Noir, is it a completed rosé, red rosé, a uh, red Pinot Noir wine, or is it you're making a, a rosé from direct by direct press method and adding that to the uh, base wine? Uh, so uh, we add the color with some uh, some Pinots at the uh, we have in, uh, uh, in full maceration, but there is direct press also for, for the to make rosé. Okay. Uh, it's just you just if you need to adjust the color, you yeah, can add adjust, a little bit of yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, red wine. The, it, yeah. the only uh, appellation can uh, uh, blend red wine with white wine is champagne. Champagne, yeah. So uh, we can. Uh, I don't know why, but uh, uh, <laughs> we we cannot use the same. Well, it's very simple. It's because. Champagne was closer to Versailles, and Versailles, the kings wanted, so they they were given special rules. But oh, yeah. I think. Yeah. And anyway, anyway, their red wine is terrible there, so it's so, yeah. so, mm -hmm. so that's that's well, it's not really terrible. No. It's just rare. Um, anyway. So for uh, both the Blanc and the Rosé, are Chardonnay and Chenin Blanc native to Lamu? We're getting out. Oh, no, no, uh, Chardonnay is uh, uh, native from the. Uh, Burgundy. So, Burgundy and Sonia. Uh, there's a little village of uh, Chardonnay. Uh, Chardonnay and, and, and Macron. Yeah. So, uh, and uh, Chenin is a uh, native from uh, the Loire Valley. Um, not huge. Uh, my knowledge in history of the grapes are not that good, but I think uh, you can. Well, I think, um, yeah, I mean, for sure, Chenin Blanc comes from the, um, from the Loire Valley. But that's where it's most well known. Um, in terms of when it was planted in Limu, I believe it was planted, um, well, it probably was planted a long time ago, but the question is when, when it really become important uh, commercially. Probably not until uh, the 1960s and 70s that people started thinking about this, even though it was present before, I would guess, and not really not until the 80s did really some, some larger plantings take place there. Ah, I think it's, it's a Chenin. Maybe more the Chardonnay even, but uh, the Chenin became famous in Lini with uh, with the regulation of Cremont. Oh yeah, yeah, sure. Oh yeah, that's so, true. Uh, yeah, that could be uh, because Cremont de, de, de Loire is really the um, it's, it's sort of the famous Cremont in uh, in France. Yeah, and I think many people uh, use Chenin also for the uh, in Lini uh, for for the Blanca because the Chenin have this potential of um, being aromatic, uh, maybe a bit more neutral than, uh, than the mosaic, but keep an high level of acidity and, uh, most of all, uh, a good ratio between uh, the, um, uh, the total acidity and the sugar. So uh, that's why we use it in, uh, in the, uh, the Chardonnay. A nice vital and uh, 
we, uh, we can do really beautiful things, even uh, in sparkling wine and uh, also in the, the lean steel wine. So, uh, uh, and I think it's the same. It's the people playing uh, Chardonnay in the moon 30, 40 years ago. Yeah. 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 I mean, you know, these things, these things we talk about people planting when they but a lot of these uh, grapes were planted before, maybe in small quantities, but people were always curious and they didn't, you know, the rules were not so uh, so rigid before. So if somebody in Limoux had liked uh, Burgundy, white yeah. Burgundy, of course they planted they planted Chardonnay. And there was nothing no one to tell them no. So we have another question from the audience. Uh, do these wines have any aging potential? Your thoughts on that? Yeah, for sure. I think... Um, I mean, I will separate uh, the ancestral. The ancestral thing has to be uh, drinking around two years. Uh, for the the rosé, we'll lose a bit of color um, in the three next years, but we'll definitely assume the aging because of the structure. Uh, and uh, and for the Cremant Blanc, also we can think about an aging of two to five years. More than five years will be, I think, not interesting because we are really on the freshness of the, uh, of the product, so, uh, something really fresh, something more on the fruits, uh, more on the fruits than the, the brioche or the, the butter flavor. But we'll have something really interesting. It's not especially something to drink uh, in the year. Well, let, let, well, actually, let me, let me follow up on this question and ask my own question. So th these are the, the wines that are currently available in the market. Um, and uh, uh, we know that the FOMAS is, is, is really kind of masterful in, in terms of reading market trends and all, not just in the United States, but in, in, in Virginia and other yeah. countries. Uh, but are there any uh, projects? Are there sort of, you know, micro cuvées or maybe of say like uh, you're, you're aging this kind of to, to, to order it in some ways so minimum 12 months but probably average of 18 to 24 months okay but at the same time are there you doing playing around in the winery where it's like well let's see let's see how long we can keep the um, aging on the leaves for maybe some things you're holding for three years rather than two years and I mean just just to, to kind of play with it we uh we do play, but we play with like a, a thousand bottles. So yeah, okay. uh, uh, we play with a, a thousand bottles, not in a way to sell it, but just more to see uh, how it will uh, evolve in the time. Uh, it's, it's a teasing, but we also uh, uh, also play on on the uh, vinification. Right. Uh, try to uh, do uh, um, fermentation barrel to see what we. We uh, we could do, but uh, um, I think on, on on this kind of product, um, one year, eighteen months, it's the good average, because we want um, when you age longer, you will get something more complex, more yeah. uh, more in, on um, uh, bakery uh, flavors. Yeah, yeah you get more brioche, uh, you more get brioche, more, 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 yeah. And um, it's not what we're looking for on this one. Right. Uh, I, the market is, I think, uh, maybe changing a bit, and more and more people know about uh, the champagne, and there's something coming uh, with the zero dosage. Sure, uh, yeah. Uh, more and more people uh, drink zero dosage. And we, good nature, there's a lot of stuff like that. And so we are. Working on it, and uh, maybe another product, but uh, in the time. Uh, but Cotemas, I think, will stay uh, will stay on this range of product, really fresh, easy to drink, and uh, um, can say that uh, on this one, uh, I will I will say that uh, a bit of uh, uh, liquor of uh, violet uh, okay. will be great. Uh, That's to make a cocktail. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's take this violet liqueur and add a little bit to it. Or, I mean, I suppose if you could for a uh, Pierre Bayard too. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's I mean, it's classic, yeah. but 
Uh, wine Anthropology from Columbus, Ohio is asking about the retail prices on these wines. Okay, uh, we are less than uh, than twenty uh, dollars. Um, it will depend on uh, on the states, but uh, yeah, less than twenty dollars. So staying on the price, you know, for people here in the U.S., for many people, sparkling wine usually means champagne. So these are are clearly much more affordable. Can you talk about similarities, differences? Um, Similarity is uh, a second fermentation bottle, which is, I think, the point in uh, in the way to make sparkling wines. There is two two way to make sparkling wines: uh, method Chama, uh, which is second fermentation in vat, and second fermentation in bottle, and an aging of this. So uh, here it's an aging of this of one year when uh, it is on the regulation. Uh, 18, 18 months at least for Champagne. For Champagne yeah. 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 Um, in terms of pressure, uh, the regulation uh, for Limoux it's uh, at least uh, three bars of pressure. We are doing six bars, so same than uh, Champagne. Um, and uh, because the, the pressure, six, six atmosphere of pressure, it's, it will depend on, uh, on the, the level of sugar that you will add, and because uh, in the longer dock we will, we can have some uh, in short maturation maturation period, uh, it will be uh, difficult to add 24 grams of sugar at the uh, liqueur de tirage uh, and get six bars of pressure. The so regulation is a bit less restrictive uh, in. Our objective is definitely to do, to make uh, something uh, uh, at six dollars per Um You know, I think I mean the the, the question comes up because um, for me I've been uh, educating people about the region for for a while now, and uh, I like wines from all over the world. I love champagne. I mean, that's just one of the great things of life. But um, you know, one of the things it, I've had Clément Limoux that has Reminded me of good champagne. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, and uh, sometimes you can think you could pour them side by side and say, okay, well, it's hard to tell the difference. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, it is fresher. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not. Uh, and I think one of the advantages of, of, of the new wines is the fact that the price points are, are, are definitely lower. We say under twenty. Well, you probably can find a lot of people markets can probably find it for closer to fifteen. Um, uh, but it, it's, but also the whole, so one, it's easier, it's more affordable, so you can buy more of it. Um, but for parties or regurgitations, it, it works well. Um, but also, um, it is just easier to drink. It's not as contemplative, you know, it's something you kind of have to think about. Um, you know, we compare it to, uh, say, some of the bigger houses in Champagne, uh, with the basic, basic cuvées, which are going to cost you maybe five, forty, forty-five dollars um, or so. And um, they will tend to be perhaps a little denser, a little broader in flavor, but at the same time, they're not going to necessarily be better made. In fact, they probably won't be better made at that, at that level. Um, you know, I think, I think people, the comparison might, people might, more, make, might uh, make more um, appropriately is to Cava uh, from, from Spain, uh, mostly from Catalonia, which is just, in fact, uh, an hour and a half, two hours uh, across the border mm -hmm. from, uh, from, yeah, from 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 Um and in that case, I think that it, you know, someone who likes really likes champagne is probably more apt to like a Clément Limoux, not because it's necessarily made better made, although it often is, and certainly it's made at at smaller volumes, yeah. you know, because big copper producers that make enormous volumes of wine. Uh, but the grape varieties that are that are used are more um, common. So Chardonnay is the predominant grape in Cremant de Limoux, and it's Pinot Noir. Uh, Chardonnay is permitted and is used by a number of uh, Cava producers, but they also have other grape, uh, gra grapes there, Chirello and Perelada and, uh, uh, and Macabeo, which, which, are, which have, a different, have a different profile. Um, and in terms of um, aging, 
the minimum requirements for, for aging uh, cava are nine months, mm -hmm. which are really the, the minimum for the Blanc de Limoux, mm -hmm. not the Clément. Clément is, 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 mm -hmm. is one year. So there is a tendency for more development. This is, we're talking about like wines at sort of a, you know, at, at, at the $15, $20 level, you know. Now, obviously, in both places, you can have wines that are much more complex. In Cava, you can have wines that are aged for, for, for several years. And in, in, in Limu, even though it's less common, there are people who do that as well. So, I mean, it's, uh, you know, as a category, it's, it's, it's quite interesting. Comparison. And Prosecco is another thing entirely. That's, you know, that's made in the bulk method, generally speaking. And it's, in my opinion, it's, it's fun to drink, but it's really an inferior product. Yeah, sorry, my Italian uh, friends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, punchy corta. That's that's that's, that's a good one. Yeah, yeah, it's really good. Yeah. yeah. So, oh. so uh, we're just getting a lot of comments about um, being amazed at the value um, that it's. You know, everyone's really enjoying the wines and can't believe they're under twenty dollars. Uh, kind of a related question: uh, When do people in France, you know, Bastien, generally drink sparkling wine? Because a lot of the time here, again, it's a cultural thing. Particularly with champagne, it's considered you know special occasion. Uh, you know, when you get your new yacht or what have you, but uh, <laughs> is it an everyday thing? Uh, what would well, people go buy yachts every day? No, yeah, every exactly. Day. Every, day, every day is yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, every day is special, uh, special day when you get a, a yacht. No, uh, in France, I think it, it's really also for a special, uh, special day, and uh, we drink uh, sparkling for uh, for the wedding, for the, the birthday, for. Uh, some parties, and, but it's not an everyday wine. Uh, it's a real luxury to drink it every day, but uh, it's not an everyday wine. Um, and it's good like that because it's something unusual and uh, uh, not necessarily necessarily has to be an occasion, but uh, it's good when you uh, make an occasion to uh, to open a bottle. Well, the good thing about opening balls, the, the bubbling, is that when you open it, it becomes an occasion. Exactly. I mean, exactly. So, um, I mean, my observation is, uh, being in France a, a lot, uh, is that people are more apt to open a bottle of sparkling wine than they are here, with a bit less hesitation. But I think that's also an economic thing, because the, there are plenty of sparkling wines which don't cost a lot of money, uh, and uh, that, that sort of the hesitation that, 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 that people have. And also, of course, they don't have that sort of um, that guilt about uh, overindulgence or uh, residual guilt about alcohol in some ways that they have this, which is ironic, of course, given, given the problems of alcohol here. But um, you know, wine has a certain people have guilt about it, not just because of alcohol, because they think that it's something that's um, a luxury product, even though it's really quite ordinary. And if you consider, like, you can buy. A lot of bottles of wine for for the same price as a six pack of good beer. Then, well, I mean, I like beer, but wine <laughs> you know, wine is, is, is it's a different function. So we're going to shift gears a little bit. We have another question, uh, wanting you to uh, talk about how Chenin Blanc came to be grown in the region. A little bit of background on that. Um. I, I, I have to say that I, I can't give any specifics. I mean, I think Bastien um, alluded to it before when he said that the creation of the category of Cremont, when they created the category of Cremont, uh, which is a, sp a sparkling wine category outside, created in France outside of Champagne, there's Cremont de Loire in the Loire Valley, there's Cremont de Bourgogne in, 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 in the um, Burgundy, there's a Cremont d'Alsace and an Alsace, there's Cremont de Limoux, and there's, there's a few other a few other places, a Cremont de Bordeaux, which I, I don't know if it's that, so people can I mean, people who own Chateau and Bordeaux can afford Champagne, you know, but but uh, but I, I think because of the, the the majority production, the greatest production of Cremont came from Loire Valley, and also and it, which had a particular flavor profile, it was Chenon Blanc. Overwhelmingly Chenin Blanc based, uh, and also because there was a big market for Cremont was Paris, which is only an hour and a half from the Loire Valley. Mm -hmm. So I think that there was some sort of um, pressure on on, on the Cremont producers in Limoux to to produce wines that had a similar profile. 
So, uh, I mean, my guess is probably it wasn't really until the 80s until Chenwong became a significant uh, plantations that came, came to the region. Now, like I said, before, it existed before because of, of trade, because of, uh, I mean, pilgrims, we didn't talk about this, but there was a lot of pilgrimage from other parts of France, other parts of Europe, to the, uh, the, 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 the shrine at, um, in Santiago de Compostola, uh, in, in Spain that actually passed through the region. And in fact, this is going back to real history, um, the Abbey de Saint-Hilaire, which is basically where Limoux was, was part of Limoux, was the place where the first documentation of, of deliberately created sparkling wine. There was, always, there was always wine with bubbles, it just nobody really wanted it. It was always considered a mistake. Mm -hmm. But uh, was documented, and the process was documented. And a lot of people passed through the, the Abbey de Saint-Hilaire on their way to Santiago de Compostola in order to make pilgrimage. And a lot of times they brought with them wine, they brought with them vines. I don't know why they would carry grape wine on their way to pilgrimage, but you know, the people are funny. They think about making money along the way, or perhaps, you know, it was a long way. They thought they'd stop for a few years here and there and create something. So they bring grapes that they know, and they plant them here and there. Um, by the way, uh, 1531, predates uh, Dom Perignon by about 150 years. Um, pardon me if I don't have the exact years right. But there's, but the local story, the local uh, myth, which could be true, is that uh, Dom Perignon passed through Limoux on his way to pilgrimage to, to pilgrimage to Santo de Compostola. Where does a where does a, a monk stay? You know, when he's on pilgrimage with other with other monks, and he stopped at Santi Lab. He was very interested in the science of viticulture. And Santillac had a lot of uh, great history of this. And so he learned a lot of the, the methods about fermentation and, and, and controlling fermentation from the, 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 the brothers at the Santillac Monastery, Abbey. And when he returned to the Champagne region, he took a lot of technology and that, that knowledge with him back to Champagne. And people who say that he was the one who created are, you know, are really being seduced by Moet and Chandon. Uh, but I mean, he drank stars, that's what the story was. In fact, he really didn't want bubbles in his wine. But anyway, uh, but I mean, I think that's, in terms of Chenin Blanc, that's, that's part of the, the mystery, I suppose, if you find out this is a precise, precise, precise answer, but... So it is definitely, Lumu is definitely the birthplace of the first sparkling wine, correct? I have, I mean, well, it's, it's the birth, that's what they say. It's the first documentation of it deliberately being produced. Yeah, is, it, is it dating 1531? I think so. That's the qu the question is like, is it is it really? Well, a lot of people produce sparkling wine in different ways. The question is, do they know how to do it? Do, can they repeat the process? And we know for a fact that in, in Limu that in Limu in 1531 there was a documentation about how it was done. But you know, things people didn't understand what fermentation was really until until Louis Pasteur anyway until, yeah, until, until right. the late 19th century. So it's not a it's not a. Um, I think the thing, I think the. Um, what is interesting is 1531. Uh, there are a couple of other also by the uh, uh, the Lord of uh, Limoux uh, at this time uh, of something fizzy and uh, and if you have others in during many right. years right. Th that 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 seems to be that we can produce the, the, this kind of product. Um, if we have done a uh, sparkling wine in, in this area, it's also because the climate was a bit different and uh, we can have some late harvest and yeah. easily stop the fermentation. Right, uh, right, right, right. They were doing filtration uh, with uh, soaps, so I just say it's <laughs> not uh, uh, like a sterilization, it's, it's, it's not really a sterilization, so, but because the climate was really I think much more colder, and especially in December, uh, at this time it was at the middle age, 1531. So uh, uh, that's why they, they can produce this kind of, uh, of wine. And year after year, they, they I think, uh, they end the, the process. They, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it could, it, it could have been earlier. I mean, it was done earlier, for sure. Yeah. But I mean, there could have been documentation earlier. Just, this is the oldest that we found. You know, just because someone someone dated it in fifteen thirty one doesn't mean that people were doing it twenty years before. 
Okay. So. Uh, we have a question, uh, again, uh, on a different track here. Are, can people visit the winery and the vineyard? Yeah, for sure. It's a pleasure for us to, uh, to sort of show the winery. Uh, uh, you just have to, uh, uh, to call a, a bit earlier and you will find uh, all the, um, uh, the details uh, on our website, uh, uh, martinol.com. Uh, Maybe you can... Uh, Spell it. Uh, yeah. uh, we'll put the information out. Yeah, you'll okay. put the information. It's my spelling. <laughs> Maybe a bit worse. But uh, um, yeah, you, you, it's a pleasure to, uh, to receive some uh, uh, people uh, interested by uh, how we make the wine and, uh, and to explain what we do because uh, uh, we do uh, we do make wine to share uh, to share with people. Uh, so um, it would be a pleasure if you, you come to the winery. So the philosophy of, of you know, uh, everyday luxury of mm -hmm. Lux Roll, I mean, that's uh, big for Domaine Paul Moss, which is the, the winery that makes Cote Moss. Uh, earlier you were discussing some sort of cocktail ideas, which we've gotten a lot of feedback on. Uh, generally, you know, winemakers, uh, in, in my experience, don't kind of like to uh, add things to their wines. You seem to have a casual uh, perspective about that. Can you... Uh, I, I think it's, it's a good way to drink a wine is uh, to make it, to have a good moment. And uh, if, we, if you add some violets, if you add some, uh, some peach, some, uh, some whatever you want, as least use a wine and use a good wine to, uh, to make a good cocktail, I think it's a base. And uh, uh, so I like to... Uh, uh, I like to uh, to mix the wine and uh, do something funny and uh, have a good time uh, when I drink the wine. I think this wine you can drink it by by itself and it's really good. But if you have, want to have a good time, you can also drink it with uh, with Aperol. You can drink it with uh, with love and make your own experience. I think that's really what is really important. Uh, I. Again, uh, I have, with my culture, I think uh, uh, I, I try to be as open as I can, and uh, I can understand that uh, uh, people will prefer something with uh, uh, vegetable sugar, some people will, uh, will like something. There is not only one good wine, and there is not one, one way to, to drink the wine. Uh, most important is she calls a winemaker. <laughs> yeah, this is this keep them employed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Sonadora from Northern Virginia asks, do you have any tips on preserving an open bottle of sparkling wine? Uh, don't put question. a silver spoon in it. That's completely, <laughs> completely. They're, 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 they're the champagne stoppers. That's the best way. That's a, uh, well, I mean, there's, I mean, there's special, specialty champagne stoppers you can, that you can buy, they're not expensive. You can pay a lot of money for them, but you can buy them for, for less than ten dollars, and uh, they do a good job. I mean, you can't—they don't work forever, but uh, you know, just drink the wine more quickly, and it'll be all right. So one to two days. Well, no, I, 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 I've, I've held them for for more than a week. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We uh, at the keep them cold. Mm -hmm. At the cellar, we uh, uh, we keep the bottle for four or five days. Uh, after on Friday night, we uh, we drink the, the leftover. But uh, uh, yeah, four day you, you can sometimes sometimes it's less, but most of the time four days it's okay. With a good stopper. Yeah. I mean, if, if things get terrible, you can just carve a cork and stick it no. in. And, I mean, but, but I mean that's that that's for like. The next morning, when you pour in your orange, drink it with your orange juice, you know, that's not, that doesn't really fit with the gas. So somebody's asking, uh, is, there a, is there a meaning of Cote Moss? What does Cote Moss mean? Of, uh, well, it's more, uh, Cote Moss in French, like, uh, uh, side, uh, the side of Mass, and uh, Mass is, uh, Jean-Claude Mass is the owner. Um, no, there is no real mean uh, of uh, Cote Moss. Um, the Moss in the south of France means a farmhouse, generally. Yeah. And he, he used to pronounce the S, and Cote is inside of Moss. So it's, it's a clever kind of play on words. Cote, with, without the accent, would be a hillside. 
or like a, a bank of a, of a coast in some way. So um, same thing with land on, on the body of water. Okay, well, we are reaching uh, the end of this, but to wrap it up, if you could kind of give some uh, final thoughts on the individual wines and, and some advice to uh, the people out there about the wines. Um, I would say that uh, these two uh, Cremant will be uh, a really great uh, wine for for Aperitif or for, for uh, Baisal. And the rosé will be uh, Really well with uh, grilled salmon. Um, uh, the the Cremant Blanc with uh, fish and uh, 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 seafood. Um, this one, as you, you mentioned, uh, the ancestral method will uh, uh, use the apple pie with a uh, with lot of uh, fruit cake. Um, we can also use, uh, even if I'm not a big, big fan of, uh, of it, but uh, Cremant Blanc will, uh, will pair with uh, um, heavy dark chocolate uh, cakes because of the acidity. Uh, it's, the contrast will be uh, interesting, I think. Um, you can. Uh, you would recommend the rosé, uh, the Cremant Rosé, with, with chocolate cake? Um, never experienced this, but. Uh, can be also, uh, I mean, I wouldn't. Yeah. I wouldn't necessarily, yeah. but I mean, because because I think that it's not. It's, it's kind of ridiculous to call this the wine a tannic wine, and all, but it has more right. tannin than than, oh, yeah, yeah, than, yeah. than this does, and I think there's some sort of uh, conflict in some sort of way. But the the fruit, the berry profile of this does have a certain harmony in some way with with that kind of thing. So I don't know. I mean, that's. Uh, I, mean, I, would, I would agree in terms of those pairings. Um, but I mean, the best time to just in the pair of the wine was, is, uh, in my opinion, is like, well, whatever you're eating at the moment and whatever wine you have on hand, and it's always going to have bubbles. So. Oh, yeah. But uh, with a, a slice of pizza, there's a criminal rosé, it's uh, really good. Oh, yeah. And uh, I experienced that and <laughs> had good, uh, no, good moments. Yeah, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. You've been walking around New York City, taking pizza and having Clément Rosé, huh? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, great. Great. Okay, so I think that wraps it up. Um, thank you for joining us, everybody. And, yeah, and just some uh, final so words. Just, just uh, I would like to, uh, to thank uh, Sud de France Développement and uh, uh, la Maison de uh, la Région Languedoc-Roussillon to receive us here in New York and uh, thanks uh, for the team to, uh, to uh, uh, make this possible. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.